Welcome to the space where creators have aligned a positive and intellectual collab of open minds. For sharing and learning from one another, it's a vibe. We give us a podcast on the mic. Subscribe, educators, spitting bars. I guess you didn't know I'm multifaceted and humble, taking off life goals. The classroom is my comfort zone where I plant and sow. Seeds of knowledge, compassion, empathy, and hope. Reading is the key to unlocking your potential. Countless benefits, including positive and mental. Regardless of the genre, books are highly influential. Go get yours, I'll get mine. Make you strive. Money mental. Come rock with me and get down to this new jam. Yeah. Yeah. With my friends, I had a very simple plan. Educate the masses through books and life lessons. It's a grand slam. I'm out. Tala Falava and welcome to the Reads of Rossa podcast. As you can tell, I am so excited to introduce today's guest. She is a Californian Indian and a linguist with a passion for advocacy and language revitalization. She is an author and the founder of Indigenous Book Club, the owner of Quiet Quail Books, and the host of the NDN Book Nerd Podcast. She is a fellow bookstagrammer who is passionate about books and the art of literature. It is my honor to welcome to the show, Carol Ann Doodle. Yay! Yay! Thank you so much, Rosa. Hakupa I. Ooh, how are you? How are you, Carol Ann? I'm doing so well. I'm so excited to be here. Podcasting is one of my favorite hobbies and just leisure activities Mm. um and rosa if you wouldn't mind i'll introduce myself as well so i'll go in my language first and then do the runaround thank you so much for such a lovely introduction by the way i really appreciate it um chinaru Nanan Atawan Fastino, Ni Yukchuiv Atawan Linet, um, Nun Tuvipiav Kika, Nun Tukov Kika, Nun Varavraniach, <laughs> Nun Varavraniach, Nun Natavaniach, um, Nuachi Quiti Kach, Nuachi Quitit Atawan Shilo, um, Nachamkana Ama Ayat. Hakupa I. So, hello everyone. My name's Karen Lan. Um, I am Marit Yam um, and a Kumeyaay descendant. And I am also um, white and Mexican on my mother's side. Um, I am a linguist and a teacher. So, I usually say, I'm a talker. I talk a lot. Ah, I <laughs> um, see. I, yeah. Um, sometimes I also say I'm a student as well, student learning my language constantly, learning all kinds of things. That's why I love reading so much. Um, I am from Southern California. Um, I have a dog named Shiloh. She's a Siberian Husky. Um, I'm a Ayat. That's all. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and yeah, I just can't wait for our discussion. So I'm so excited. Oh, man, that was so buzzy hearing <laughs> you speak. In your native la- in your language, whoa, that was great. Never, I've never, I have to say, I've never heard it being spoken before. So thank you, man. What an yes. honor! Yes, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, and I mean, it's 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 definitely my every day is something that I'm trying to live in my language as much as I constantly can. And mm. I am just a lot of times I only measure my progress from my past self. And I just try to, I definitely have role models for my language, but equally, I also just like to measure to myself. And the fact that it's become such an everyday for me now at 27, I'm going to be 27 Mm. soon. I'm so grateful for that because it used to be a challenge to incorporate it in my everyday with everything in my life that was going on and going to school and just also healing you know our Mm. generational um experiences with you know not speaking our language so yeah it's it i would try to live and breathe it every day as much Mm. as i can and it 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 heals yeah (laughs) i mean are you part of a, a community so when you say that you try and live it and speak every day are there are you surrounded by a community where you can do that is it self study is it actually uh yeah like how do you how do you do that 
Yeah, it's it's both self study and also in community. So mm-hmm. I'm so grateful for all my family that I get to spend a lot of time with learning and speaking together. And each time it just like in the middle of it, sometimes when we're just making jokes and, you know, um, explaining things or, you know, making our own progress, just like when it dawns on me that we're making jokes in Indian and we're talking in Indian the whole time, I'm just like, oh, there's like a shimmer in my eye and in my heart. (laughs) Sometimes I've always been like, okay, I can't, I don't want to cry because I'm just Mm. like, oh, it's so beautiful how you know, the the best moments are when you get to share it with each other, when you get Mm. to share it with your family. And so I do do a lot of self stuff too. And there'd be some times where I just film myself talking if I noticed I didn't Mm. talk that much that day. So yeah, it can definitely both be both. Yeah. So from a young age, was it, uh, was your language being spoken in your home or is it now that you're older, you're being a bit more intentional uh, with the learning process, uh, with, you know, staying connected to your cultural roots? Because you also mentioned yeah. that you're, uh, you have, you're part Mexican and white. So I'm just thinking about, like, identity-wise, like, totally. how you stay connected to those different areas of who you are. Yeah, so... Um, so my dad is um, Serrano and Kumiyai, and then um, my mom had, you know, Spanish, Mexican, and white ancestry. Um, so on my mother's side, my grandparents spoke Spanish, um, but we did not speak Spanish in our home. And then on my father's side, from when he was a little kid, he spoke Indian, and he heard it all the time from our aunties our auntie spoke a lot around him. And so he, he could speak when he was younger. Um, He was luckily the first in our family, the first in our family generation to not be sent to a boarding school here in California. Um, Our grandparents were sent to boarding schools and that's where they were as uh, unless, I mean, I, I'm always assuming that people know this, but I know that there's still people learning about this, that boarding schools, particularly in California, are where um, our native languages were strongly, strictly discouraged. Um, You know, just for, it was illegal, it was forbidden, and you were punished greatly. So my dad was the first generation to not have to go to a boarding school like that. Um, But once I, um, once my parents had me, which was later um, in my dad's life and later in my mom's life, they were they were only speaking English in my home when I was a child. Mm-hmm. So I only heard English on a day to day basis. And it was around the time like in middle school and high school, thanks to my community. So thankful to my community that I started to hear the language and hear our language spoken a lot more often. And since I, I, so I would say I've been on this personal journey um, to reignite that in myself um, and with my family since I was like 19 years old is kind of when I really started to be like, okay, I'm going to try to be consistent with this and put some intention in it. Um, And now I'm going to be 27. And it's so funny because when I was a kid, I wouldn't really ask questions like that about the language in our home and if my dad spoke or, and a lot of times his answer would be, no, I don't speak that. No, I don't speak. No, no. Or I don't remember. I don't know. And now since it's become, since I'm 27 and especially within the last like three to four, five-ish years, I am amazed to see my dad knows a lot of our languages. He knows a lot. And in fact, now he's teaching me sometimes, which is so cool. <laughs> um, yeah, so all to say, it's really incredible for our elders how, they, you know, it, it's traumatic for them as well. So for them, a lot, when I would first have this experience in my home, I would be like, oh, I don't know. I don't speak that. I don't know any of that. Mm. And I think what's been amazing is like with him and my other family watching our elder kind of heal through that process as we kind of reignite. And so 
I just visually see, you know, what's incredible is for my dad is just how emotional language is tied and how now that it's such a regular practice in our home, you know, when sometimes we just throw out some phrases and we're learning together, he gets a glimmer in his eye and remembers when his aunties would say something like that. And he's like nearly crying. And I'm so happy to see just those memories come alive for all of us because it it's so special when it's said in Indian and you can remember mm. the first times you heard that, you know? So I just, I'm so grateful to have my dad around to see yeah, to, to see the generations, mm. the differences that are happening now. So, uh, You know, you mentioned the boarding schools. I, I, I didn't know about that. Um, and so thank you for sharing. And I yeah. wonder in terms of that history and if we think about uh, intergenerational trauma, like is that history taught in schools uh, where you grew up? Like is it mm -hmm. common knowledge? Uh, yeah, I would say no, it's not mm. common knowledge. And it's not taught very often when I was a kid. I'll say things are changing now, so I'll just speak mm. of when I was a kid. Um, uh, so just in case anybody needs a reference, I was born in 96, so that can be mm. your reference for what schooling was like for me in the early 2000s. And no, it wasn't mentioned. In fact, we here in California have, missions that were part of, you know, the Spanish colonization. And so in our education systems, often it was glorified, the mission mm. system, even though it was enslavement and it mm. was, you know, genocide for a lot of Native people across California. And after the mission system, then came the boarding schools. And um, I did not see that in curriculum until I was in high school. And I was probably 15 or 16 years old. And it was such a brief mention in my US mm -hmm. history class. And um, I tell this story kind of often that this US history class that I was in, what was really great about it is our teacher at the time, who I really respected, um, allowed us to choose a topic to present on. We They called it a seminar for us to present on to the class. So we got to choose what we wanted to talk about. And he had put boarding schools as a topic for a seminar presentation. And I think about it now and I'm like, if I wasn't in that class, you know, and I didn't take it upon myself as the native girl to talk about that, would had it, it been presented and discussed in detail in our mm -hmm. and you know in our educational experience for my classroom and my best friend did the presentation with me and it was really amazing i got to add you know that personal touch of to bring it close to home and be like i'm only the second generation that didn't get to go to one of these schools that's how close mm -hmm. it is to us in this room um and so I, you know, I had done a presentation because boarding schools were across the United States. Um, and in Canada, they called them residential schools. And so, yeah, it wasn't talked about when I was in primary school. I knew about it personally from my home and my mm. community has made a really amazing effort to, you know, bring a lot of awareness to that history and talk about how it's still manifest today mm -hmm. um and i will say it is very common i've had this experience a lot and you'll read about this from other native california elders it's hard for our elders to talk about because it was so it was like a labor camp and there was a lot of escaping and there are kids that didn't get to escape um and yeah so all to say it makes sense that also for our elders, why it is, it's a difficult subject to talk about. And so I really appreciate the amount of grace that a lot of people have given for people to take their time to come out with their story. And then equally, I really think those elders that have spoken about it so much so that us kids can learn about it too.
Mm. Are these stories being shared through, like, are there people writing about these stories, you know, uh, difficult to speak on, but perhaps through literature, you know, Absolutely. are there stories out there? Oh, so many, so many. I can recommend, there's there's even a really great um, graphic novel that I share mm. in my shop that um, is about boarding schools. I'm so sorry, I have to remember some of them off the top of my head. But I can definitely share you a link with some really great literature that talks about these experiences. Mm. Um, one that is really relevant to here is called Boarding School Blues. That is um, a piece of literature that talks about a lot of boarding schools, and it's a book that you can buy. Um, there's one that I carry in my shop called Genocidal Love, I believe. Um, it has a yellow cover, and it's about residential school history from the point of view of those who survived it. Um, and there's one book that I remember in particular, if we're talking literature as well, called Probably Ruby. And it's literature, actually. The other mm -hmm. ones that I mentioned are nonfiction, and they are reporting about residential schools, boarding schools, and the experiences. But if you'd like a literature point of view to kind of talk about that, probably Ruby has um, some really great narrative experiences about boarding schools that I think it is really powerful to even talk about that through fiction because you're reading it from the point of view as if you're living it yourself almost because you're like following that mm. character's point of view. And to be, what I think is so powerful about literature is the ability to practice empathy um, and think about what, it, it's an opportunity to escape for a second and read from another point of view um, about that experience. Another comic book that also talks about um, boarding schools is Redbone, the history of a Native American um, rock band. And Redbone was really popular in like the 60s and 70s in this area. And But they also talk about boarding schools and how they were affected by boarding schools in their family. Um, mm -hmm. So I would be happy to provide even more list of places to learn about that. Everyone awesome. check the bio. We'll have uh, Carol Ann or her social media platforms, her podcast, the bookstore, uh, and links. So many, so many things yeah, for yeah, you yeah. to learn about, um, you know, uh, Californian Indians and her people and their culture and language. So uh, check out the bio. When you were at school, were you a reader? You know, were you a reader growing mm -hmm. up? You love books, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. When did it start? Right. So, yes, in middle school, I would say was when the fervor like really was mm -hmm. set in. <laughs> and I in middle school, I just absolutely adored books, absolutely adored them. So probably it started probably when I was like 10 and 11. Um, but I'll say it was even before them. Like, I remember just going through a bunch of books when I was like six or seven in first grade. Um, and I will say my dad is a massive pro prolific reader. He reads the newspaper, a physical newspaper every single day. And wow. he reads books every single day. And so, yeah, just even from like one to two years, three years old, like some of my like most vivid memories as a child, I think. And what I see my dad in my head sometimes is when I was a little kid, just playing, looking up at my dad and there he is with this book <laughs> and his glasses. <laughs> and there I am like playing on the ground and he's always got a book in his hand, you know? And in the morning too, when, you know, I became bigger and stuff and it'd be time for school, he'd have his paper out. And once I could sit on his lap, sometimes I'd like to steal his glasses. <laughs> And hold the newspaper and, you know, pretend like I can read the newspaper. <laughs> um, or, yeah, I, you know, grab his books and stuff like that. And my dad was very intentional um, since I was like three and four years old. And he was 
teaching me how to read even before I was in preschool and before I was in kindergarten. And he would, you know, sit at the table or just constantly we were practicing reading. And so once I'd get older, he'd take me to bookstores and take me to the library and stuff and get me a bunch of books. And, um, but middle school was where like going to the bookstore with my dad (laughs) and just getting piles and piles of stuff that I could read was my favorite experience ever. Um, and yeah, even our local children's bookstore, we have so many good memories going there. Um, but even outside of my dad, even just, I have a lot of memories as a kid. And when I was, you know, hanging out with my family and stuff, and I'd be in the corner, like reading a book, and they'd mm. be like, come play, you know, come watch, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, okay, I will in a minute. Hold on, I really got to finish this chapter. <laughs> <laughs> I really have to see what happens next. Um <laughs> But as a kid, I really enjoyed fiction. I read a lot of fiction when I was a kid. Mm. Um, High school, I kind of lost my passion for reading. It's probably because I had so much schoolwork on my plate (laughs) that then reading became like kind of a chore. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Being forced, huh? Being forced to read that English book. (laughs) Yeah. I will say, though, that even in classes where I had to read literature, I still value all of those experiences. So like Mm. in school, reading The Old Man in the Sea, reading, you know, The Red Pony, reading To Kill a Mockingbird. These are all novels that I finished in school. Invisible Man, I read that in high school. Powerful book. Um, Incredible book. The Scarlet Letter. Um, You know, just those, I still remember those experiences, even if I was kind of assigned to do them. It was a really great opportunity to read those books as well. Um, but I wasn't leisurely reading during that mm-hmm. time in high school. I was just more completing the books that I was assigned to read. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, so then in college, again, so much more reading in college. <laughs> but I, you know, during that time as well, sometimes I'd have to read fiction and those were great experiences as well. But I didn't start my bookstagram reigniting my passion for fiction, leisure fiction, fiction that I want to read and particularly native fiction. I didn't start that journey until 2019. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was because I've always had a passion for reading, but it was 2019 and I was on vacation And I don't know, I just remember I was just having a thought process and I was like, when have I read a fiction book by a native author? Like, when have I done that? And I had been 24 at the time, I think. I was 24 when I asked myself that question. And I was like, I don't think I have. I think every native character that I had read in a book, a fiction book, was from a non-native author. Um, And I'm just, again, talking about fiction. I had read Mm. plenty of nonfiction by native authors, but I had not read a fiction book. I'm pretty certain of that Um, when I was 24. And I was like, you know what? When's a better time to start than I'm on vacation? (laughs) Let's start it right now. So yeah, I just started buying some books and just like really digging into that. And it just has led me on this whole journey of mm. trying to read so much more literature by Native authors. And my dad mm. has been part of that journey. And he, I think his favorite thing to say to people about my bookstore and my bookstagram is he's all, I get free books too. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Dad. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Or we um, get I want our, to... our own little book club. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> That's so cool. Um, and we will get into the book club and bookstagram. Mm. Uh, I want to end your bookstore, of course. I wanted to just quickly ask, you know, as a linguist uh, studying, you would have done a lot of academic reading. So in terms of diversity and inclusion, were BIPOC voices being represented in in the academic texts that you were uh, reading, researching, or was it mostly dominant culture focused? Yeah. 
I will give a major credit to um, a few of the professors that I've had um, in linguistics, and they had um, Black, Indigenous, people of color, color authors in mm-hmm. linguistics and anthropology, and they made that a point mm-hmm. of discussion in every single one of our classes. Um, which is so incredible and was really great for me, even outside of my own native experience. We read um, even, you know, um, communities that I'm not a part of. Um, So we read um, Black linguists, um, Mm -hmm. Black linguists who would talk about African-American vernacular English, so AAVE. And, Mm -hmm. you know, that those professors would show us like, amazing literature and videos and news articles and stuff about black linguists that are challenging this dominant narrative that AAVE isn't English, Mm. isn't proper English. And what even does that mean? Right. Mm. Um, And what my favorite thing from one of those classes too was reading from black linguists. And then I particularly remember in one class, our professor showed us a video of a school in Oakland, California, that had black teachers and predominantly black and other students of color, Latinx, other students of color. And they were actually, which I really am just so amazed at their, um, at the change that they're making, they were incorporating AAVE into the classroom alongside standard American English. Mm. And they were teaching AAVE and teaching standard, you know, American English. And they were witnessing how revolutionary that was for their students to feel seen in the classroom, to feel validated, to feel reflected in their teachers and their curriculum. And it was a really monumental way for them to also talk about standard American English and be like, these are two valid languages. Mm. And here's how you can learn both of them. You know, and I just thought that was so cool. So yes, we had a lot of that. And then we also had native authors in Mm. my linguistics classes. So Daryl Baldwin is an amazing native Miami author that we read in a lot of my linguistics classes. Um, and I, I'm like looking at my desk right now. It's um, okay. <laughs> Anton, oh. um, Anton Truer, um, mm. the Language Warriors Manifesto, incredible academic from Minnesota, but also um, teaches in Canada, linguistics, linguist in academia. That's another incredible author that's been included in my classes. Um, So yes, I'm so grateful that there has definitely been a shift in academia to not focus just mostly on dominant um, culture authors. I mean, you're a teacher. Uh, What do you teach? Uh, Like, I don't want to be like obvious and be like, are you a teach linguistics? But you know, I don't want to be like that guy. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And I say teacher super loosely. I'm still Mm. learning, you know, and I'm getting, I'm, I'm working on um, a credential and stuff like that. So, Mm. but I teach um, our language. um, That's so cool. Yeah. But even then I, maybe it's just like a confidence thing, but also I'm like, I teach, but also I learn at the same time. So right. Lifelong learner, right? You just keep learning. My favorite thing is when students teach me things and correct Mm. me. And I'm like, I just love, I love how we're going on a journey together, you Mm. know? And I have, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Carolyn. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, I have a lot to learn myself. And Mm. kids have a lot to teach us. (laughs) (laughs) Kids have a lot to teach us about the world, too. I think Mm. my, my pedagogy for the classroom is kids are not an empty vessel for me Mm. to pour into. I can also be a vessel that can be poured into. Yeah. That was nice. I want to talk about Indigenous Book Club, an online collective that reads and discusses books by Indigenous authors. And how does the book club work? Is it a monthly? Is it a, how often 
Uh, do you meet? Uh, where are book club members from? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, I miss Indigenous book club so much. It's been on hiatus for mm. a few months now. Um, but that's what also started me on the journey of mm. Bookstagram is um, I actually s started and with some other folks did started as Indigenous Book Club. And our goal was to read mm. authors, you know, um, various Native authors. And a lot of times we, do, we would do suggestions from around the world even, you know. Mm. Um and like multi-genre, you know, just like trying to include so many different types of genres in our reading. Um, and it was so awesome. It ran from 2020 mm -hmm. um, to 2022. So it ran for two years. Mm -hmm. And we, I want to say we read about like 10 books together, maybe more. Um and yeah, there it was an online community and we were meeting virtually um, on Discord at the time. And so we'd have a lot of people from all over, which was so cool. Especially, I think, just even this, you know, just like getting to meet people from a native indigenous context from different places geographically um, mm. was incredible for expanding, you know, our knowledge and our experiences and making, fr I think internet friendships are just as valid as mm -hmm. any other kind of friendship. I've had friends that I've had online and that I consider best friends for like over a decade. I've never met them in person, but we are friends, you know, and we've carried a friendship for so long. Um, and so that was also just my favorite part of the book club as well. Um, mm -hmm. But I just got to read because of our club and because of um, so many people who are reading with us. I got introduced to so many different types of books mm -hmm. from authors that, you know, I'd, I'd never heard of or experienced. And so that was a really fun experience. It's on hiatus for now. Right. I hope one day when I have more time and capacity, it could be something that, you know, that is reignited again. Hmm. Do you have some books that you brought to uh, rave about or share, or you've got, have you got a whole selection in front of you? Anything you want to yes. shout out and highlight? Yes. Okay. So um, I have it in the other room. So there's three books right now that um, are that I'm reading. I'm reading three hmm. books. Two are from um, native authors, and so this is one of them. The Lost Journals of Chicago Wea, which is a mm. novel that is forthcoming um, by Deborah Magpie Erling. I am enjoying this so much. Like I am, wow, it is beautiful. Chicago Wea's story, um, which I just found out her name in her language is often mispronounced here mm. in the States. Sometimes it's, people say Sacagawea, which, you know, that's that was what the dominant culture was saying but i've been learning that it is pronounced differently it is an indigenous language mm. you know so it is um it is her name and so this is kind of oh it's so incredible it's like from sakaga way's viewpoint and her village and her community and it's telling the story fictionally from her eyes mm. and it's like poetry but like narrative um oh my gosh her deborah magpie erling's writing is so powerful and it's so vivid every time i like talk about her i'm like it's so vivid and like visceral it's and she just like she goes into intense detail about mm. nature and describing the natural elements around all of her characters and it's it's so wild like you know I get transformed in books a lot where it mm -hmm. just feels like oh my gosh I'm in this world you know um there's some that it's harder to do that for but hers I'm just like whoa like I'm swallowed you know in <laughs> her, 
in her descriptions. Um, and she had another book that was republished called Perma Red last mm. year. And Louise Erdrich, who um, is another another author that I have on my table, mm. um, she's probably like one of the biggest Native American classic literature writers now, like contemporary. And Louise Erdrich has a lot of really good um, recommendations and reviews of Deborah Erling. So that's one that I'm reading right now that I can't wait to come out. <laughs> mm. And um, Deborah often writes about MMIP, Missing and Murdered Indigenous People, Missing and mm. Murdered Indigenous Women in particular. Um, and, you know, uh, misogyny and the violence that's wreaked upon um, indigenous women in the United States. Mm. And that's also what Perma Red was about. And so, again, I'm such a fan of fiction to be able to communicate an awareness about parts of history that we have to learn about, mm. or, you know, contemporary issues that are facing us. And then the other book that I have in my bedroom, which is next door, is um, Don't Fear the Reaper by Stephen Graham Jones, which is a horror novel. <laughs> <laughs> and I am so into horror right now, which is so funny because I, I haven't always been into horror films and horror novels, horror novels. It wasn't until like, three or four years ago, I've been really doing a deep dive into horror films and horror books. And Stephen Graham Jones, he's Blackfeet. He mm -hmm. is like, he is a really amazing horror author. And often, if not always, brings a native character and perspective into his horror fiction. So... Yeah. <laughs> wow. I, I want to talk about Quiet uh, Quail Books. You're the owner of an Indigenous bookstore. Uh, was that always a dream of yours to own a bookstore? Yeah, I would say no, it wasn't always a dream. I don't think when I was a kid or when I was younger and, you know, when I was like thinking about my life, I don't think that I saw myself, you know, being a small business owner or owning a bookstore, it started to become something that I was really, really keen on doing um, during the pandemic. And mm. um, I was so keen on it because after starting my journey into Native literature and then reflecting on how impactful it was for me as a kid to go to bookstores and go to independent local bookstores, yeah, it was when I was in college and the pandemic was setting in that I was like really daydreaming often mm. <laughs> um, about a, a, a native bookstore, an indie bookstore. And also just like even aside from the native stuff, just like a bookstore in general, mm. like owning a bookstore that's like local and um because even when I continue daydreaming about my business, I see it also being able to hold others' books that are from a different background um, and from a different identity, experience, ethnicity. Um, so, yeah, it was within the last three years that that really became a fervor and, like, an absolute destiny that I had to like make happen. <laughs> mm. Do you have yeah. people that come into your bookstore and request books like just that you've never heard of? Oh, you know? all the time. Yeah. So mm. I'll say also I'm a pop-up bookstore. So I was going to ask you about bookstore. that. Yeah. Yes, because I saw yes. and I was just like, I need to know how this works and how is it yeah. going? <laughs> totally. So yeah, we so there's like a few different terms that we use in the bookstore community, pop up mm -hmm. bookstore, mobile bookstore, and sometimes they even say novel models mm -hmm. of a bookstore because the there's so many unique, very cool types of bookstores out there that are not a traditional, you know, four mm -hmm. walls 
you know, in a city type of thing. They call those like brick and mortar establishments, you know. Um, so I'm a pop up, which means that I go to a lot of different types of events. And so I go to like powwows, I go to conferences, I go to markets, I go to museums, I go to, you know, breweries, libraries, mm-hmm. all kinds of places around Southern California. Um, and my bookstore is there. And I what's really awesome about it is I go where the people are. Wow, I go, I go to the customer. <laughs> um, and a lot of what's really awesome is that a lot of, you know, native um, parents, families, kids, students, are already at events like this, powwows Mm. and, you know, um, museums and like, you know, all kinds, like markets and they're already there for so many different reasons. Mm. And then a lot of them happen upon my bookstore and they're like, (laughs) oh my God, what is this? Mm. And I'm like, it's a bookstore. Um, And definitely the number one question that I get asked is like, do you have a physical location? Mm -hmm. Um, do you have a a brick and mortar? No, I don't right now for now. I don't. Um, but I do online and I do pop-ups and to your question, Rosa, about, you know, do I get asked about books that I've never heard of all the time? Almost every time I do a pop-up, someone will inquire or introduce me to a new book, um, or a new graphic novel or a new comic book. And that is really cool every time, especially when I go, you know, research it and like start looking up stuff about it after the fact. Sometimes, though, you know, um, I have no clue what they're talking about. (laughs) And I'm like, oh, there's so many books in the world. You know what I mean? There is so many. And so they'll ask me specific questions about something and I'll be like, I'm so sorry. I don't know about this. I'll have to, you know, research it and get back to you. Um, but yeah, it can go either way. And a lot of the times it really goes in the direction of like, oh, wow, thank you so much for telling me about that. I'll thank you. I just like so cool that I got introduced to that, you know, and got Mm. to look it up. And yeah, and like, one of my um, things that I've just been trying to do a lot more of, is just try to, you know, find, you know, because indigenous is such, it's such a broad term. Um, And so I do try my best to, especially around North America, Mm. trying to find authors that um, I can have in my bookstore. But I will say that I do prioritize heavily California Indian authors. Mm -hmm. And that was one of the biggest reasons I wanted to have a bookstore as well, is that to my knowledge, anyone can correct me, there is not a California Indian bookstore, you know, owned by California and like folks. There's publishing houses, which are incredible. Shout out to all the California native publishing programs and um, publishers. They're so awesome. The work that they're doing to help people from our state get published. Um But I wanted to find a bookstore that really made an effort because we're here in California. And what has been really cool, too, is just the look on people's faces when they're like, oh, my God, you have this book. Oh, my God, this one, this one, this one. Because the amount of times I've gone to local bookstores looking for Native authors, and there's very few to be found. Mm. (laughs) And... They may have some, they but they have, you know, a smaller section. And I will say what it is frustrating is that a lot of bookstores have us only as history. Mm. It'll just be like Native American history. And that's the section. And there's not even a like Native literature section, you know, mm. like we don't get anything like that <laughs> in a bookstore. So that was one of the biggest reasons I wanted to open my bookstore is Oh, there's so many history books out there. Don't get me wrong. They're incredible. But I'm like, let's do something mm. for the imagination, the creative, the literature, the narrative. I want a store that is really focusing on that. So I made one. <laughs> You're awesome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, 
Yeah. yeah. So, are you, you're an are you a writer as well? Do you have you been published? Are you looking yeah. to publish? What what what's the situation, Carol? I love that question. <laughs> I love that question. Um, so I you I write a lot of nonfiction. I've written mm. a lot of like opinion op ed reviews, published in magazines, magazines wow. mostly. Um, but not anything like a major magazine, um, but native magazines, which are my favorite to read. Um, and I am a poet, so I do write mm. poetry and I really love poetry. It's so healing. Um, I got introduced to poetry in my young adult life when I was really struggling with my mental health and really struggling mm. with my sobriety. And, um, it was it was like it came at the perfect time for me to be like you know what that pen to paper pen to mm. paper um so i don't have a book published um i do perform my poetry Ooh. and yeah i do post my poetry from time to time but in terms of authorship I'm not sure if I will publish a book one day. It's something really? I get asked. Yeah, I get asked. I feel a lot. like you would be, I don't know. I feel like you do all this advocacy work around language. And, and I just feel like, Carolyn, that would Thank be the you. ultimate next step. Like, I appreciate that, right? And I mean, I've definitely talked about it to my dad because we mm. just, we both had such a fervor for books. And I'm like, man, what if I write one one day, you know? Um, I will say at this point in my life, I am just, it's so fun to be a reader. It's just like, part of my thing too, I appreciate authors so much. And, but equally, authors need readers. You know, they need mm -hmm. people like you and me, Rosa, who we make it happen for them in the same way. You know, we support them we champion them we platform them we praise them we review their books we talk about all those things um and so i the reader experience is just like so fun because it's just like non-stop learning you know um but i think later in my life there might be a time that i would publish a book um and Fiction would be really cool. I would I would love it to be fiction. I don't I don't have a ton of experience with writing fiction. I've read mm. so much fiction, so um, but I'm so happy to be, you know, a reader that gets to experience all kinds of different stories. But mm. yeah. Yeah. Um, I love picture books. So I was wondering <laughs> if there are picture books that have been published in your language. Oh, yes. Um, oh, it's so funny you asked that. I can't talk about it oh. after the <laughs> recording. Um, we could talk about that. <laughs> I was just, okay, I just was like, yeah. oh, I have to ask because I love Agreed. Um, I love so much. Books. I love picture books too. And I will say that um, Lynn Risling Baldy. Mm. is a um a hoopa illustrator and okay. author and she's published some really awesome books mm. in um hoopa language and then another one oh there's so many i can point you to so many that have california indigenous languages wow. i was just reading um soldiers unknown um is that what it is that what it's called Soldiers Unknown, and it's by a Yurok author, um, which is, again, up north, um, mm. California. And he has some Yurok language in his comic book, which I just, again, equally, I'm like, give me the illustrations and the visuals. Right. Like, I want to see the beauty, you know? Um, so that's a really great one. And, yeah, Great Oak Press, which is a publisher here in California, publishes a lot of really awesome books mm. in California indigenous languages. And yeah, that is something that's so cool to me. So cool. Have you read any uh, books by Pacific Island authors? I have, yes. And I just um, 
finish this earlier this was it this year? Yeah, earlier this year I just finished Aue by oh, by Becky Manawatu. I'm yes. reading it now. I, that, I, that's my current read right now. Incredible! Oh, I know everyone goodness. that's read it has told me, "Oh my gosh, it's a it's absolute must read." So I've just yeah started it. it it's so good. Um, mm. it was so cathartic. Like, mm. and I just, I mean, one of my, this is my favorite thing about so many native authors that I've noticed across North America and the Pacific islands mm. is their ability to pass through time in mm. their fiction is so unique and beautiful. And then to pass through generations in families, like so many native authors don't just tell the story of like right. one family and like one point of time. They are moving throughout, right. you know, multiple points of view and like multiple time periods. Mm -hmm. And that is such a powerful, you know, tool that I don't think just any author can pull off, you know, and there's so many other authors like Homegoing which is by Yagi Yassi, who is um, mm. a Black author. She mm. also equally, like, goes through multi-generations. And I felt that way about Aoue. And, like, you know, the characters that she had, their stories were just... I just love books also that shift point of views, you know? Mm. Like, each chapter has a different point of view. Those are some of my favorite books. Um mm. Yeah. So that one and then other ones. So I stock some in my store as well. And um, there's one that I've been wanting to read. Um, oh, it's by a Native Hawaiian author. Mm -hmm. And it's like short stories. Um, and I want to say it's called Something Paradise. I can't remember it right now. Uh, I think I know what you're talking about, actually. Yeah. And it has um... like, it's in a car. The cover is in a car, and it has one of those, like, maybe irritating little hula dancers. <laughs> oh, I know exactly <laughs> what you're talking about. It's actually, I, I was, I'm getting ready to, I think, mm -hmm. I, I'm sure, sorry, let me just, uh, because I'm getting ready to post it. Oh, sorry. It's okay. It's, okay. I can look I know exactly what you're talking it. about, because I'm getting ready to post it on my bookstagram this week. I'm just, like, highlighting different authors, but I know what you're talking about. Me? So, okay, totally. I can find it right now because I remember I posted it also. This is, this is Paradise by Christiana. Exactly, okay. Yeah. Like, this is I'm Paradise. Gonna, like, <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so funny. I was like, oh, that sounds so familiar. Yeah, it's like in my drafts so that I could just release it as the week, as the days of the week go on. You're yes. funny. <laughs> <laughs> So that one, I mm. really want to read. I will say, if you have any recommendations, a lot of my um, recommendations for Pacific Islander um, authors, mm. I get who I'm show, sure you know who I'm talking about. I get them from Katrina. Oh, yeah, Polynesian also, Reader. Yes, Polynesian Reader. I love her recommendations. Yeah. And she's so sweet. Um, love her YouTube videos as well. So mm. this is what I was going to say. I have not read a fiction book from a Samoan author or a Tongan author. Okay, I'll if send you have you recommendations. Some, I will send you some links. Yes. Love yes that. and yes. <laughs> and then also I haven't read one from a Micronesian author. Mm. Um, so and there are, are all some out there, so... Yeah, yeah. I was very um, lucky. And when I was in college, I made a lot of friends mm. that are Pacific Islander and Native Hawaiian, Chamorro. Mm. Um, wow. Yeah, um, Tongan, Samoan. And so I just learned so much from them about, you know, Pacific Islander experiences, histories, cultures. And of course, I'm like, yeah, let's read books. <laughs> that's cool yeah. <laughs> i want to talk about in the in book nerd the <laughs> podcast i have to absolutely highlight this uh yes tell us yeah. about your podcast 
Yes, this other creative journey that I'm trying to be on. <laughs> um, yes. Man, I'm like pressuring myself because I haven't posted another episode, but I have three of them recorded. Don't pressure um, yourself. All in good time, you know, all, all in, in your time. time. No rush mm -hmm. at all. Right? For real. It's all about fun. That's my yes. favorite thing about it. It's Absolutely. Fun. Yeah. So I um, used to be a, a public radio journalist. Ooh. Um, I, I went to school originally to be a journalist and happened upon public radio as a route. And so, um, I started wow. from a, yeah, I started like when I was like 18 or 19, 19 years old, 18, 19, um, getting into studios and learning about audio, audio engineering, interviewing, research, all kinds of stuff in my journalism program. And that just like sparked my fervor for podcasting and audio engineering and formatting. Um, and so then, you know, I did transfer to another school and I got back into it. It's something that I never like really lost. I just have consistently been listening to podcasts since I was like 19, 20 years old. Mm -hmm. um, and then Again, I was re-exploring it last year and I, you know, um, interned with NPR. I worked with another radio station in California. I even um, interviewed for some jobs in public radio here in Southern California, like KCRW and um, uh, what's the other one called? KCRW and there's another one locally that's really big. Um, and so I was interviewing for there as well. Um, and again, I just loved, I just love audio engineering. I love microphones. I love the whole process of it. I love, you know, posts, like creating scenes. It's a very, it can be a very creative endeavor, yeah. audio stuff. Um, and so then I, you know, I ended up not, um, pursuing my employment in public radio anymore. Um, I was, you know, doing different kinds of job searches at the time and ultimately decided that I wasn't going to pursue public radio anymore. Then I was thinking I miss audio engineering so much. I miss podcasting. I miss interviewing. I miss, you know, being on a mic and sitting on my editor after and like listening, tuning, getting the music, all kinds of stuff. And I was like, you know what? I'm doing books right now. Love podcasting. I have the skills to do both. <laughs> Why not keep it up? <laughs> so, um, yeah, I came up with Indian Book Nerd. Um, so it's funny. NDN is like a little acronym. Yeah. That a lot of us natives out here in the States, the way that we say it, we don't really say like Indian. There's like it's a certain way on the Indian. res. Where it's, right. Yeah, exactly. Like Indian. Ah, Indian. Yeah. gotcha, gotcha. It's, it's got a little bit of an accent to it. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I Indian. see. Yeah. And here in California in particular, I'll speak for myself and a lot of my cousins and friends. You know, we grew up saying Indian, like, oh, mm. Mm, oh, a couple Indian guys over there, you know, introduce mm. themselves to us. You know, that's how we talk. Um, and a lot of the terms, too, that people use is like California Indian. So mm. anyways, that's where that NDN came from. I and love it. um yeah, and I just wanted to geek out about books with all <laughs> kinds of guests on my mm. show. And it's been so fun because mm. I've also, you know, I spend a lot of time with other native book nerds, for sure. Wow. And equally, though, I've met all kinds of people that are non-native and love books as well and are very passionate about, you know, changing the book scene. And so I also wanted Indian Book Nerd to be a way to kind of pull the curtain as well. Like, what is publishing like? What is bookstores mm. like? What is authorship like? What is illustration like? What is, you know, working in a library like? Like, books can have so many different formats of mm. being involved in such a massive industry. And so I wanted to interview all types of people, but with kind of a native lens in mind as well. Mm. Yeah. That's so cool. Um, I love that. I love that so <laughs> much. So for me, um, like with my podcast, so like 
when you were talking about bookstagram i also started a bookstagram account in 2019 that's my account now Rita wow. Rosa. and I'm so basically yeah, was like, <laughs> this was meant to be but basically yeah. uh, because i'm a teacher so i started it so that i could connect with authors and get book recommendations for my students like it was really like education based mm -hmm. um and then i just connect like i on my account i follow obviously books to grammars authors uh and it became a way to not only connect with my favorite authors but really trying to find out who were our uh pacific island authors you know yes. out there who are the polynesian authors so it's become mm -hmm. this like platform which has been so good um finding out what books are dropping that kind of thing but then with the podcast which i started in 2021 uh, like i was just like what are we going to call the podcast but then it was just like oh i don't want to i don't want to create another account for the podcast so i just called it reads with rosa podcast with books being the thing that kind of brings people together so Agreed. obviously I've, <laughs> yeah. i mean i've i've interviewed like my favorite like some of my favorite rappers i love hip-hop so i've had musicians yes. and artists i've had so rappers cool. i've had uh, a lot of performing arts folks you know creatives i've had pacific island authors um just had you know bipoc folks so this i've had educators librarians mm -hmm. like so i've yeah. had um people from all walks of life that i follow most of them i follow on instagram or other social media platforms and i'm just really inspired like you i've been watching <laughs> okay that sounds like stalkerish <laughs> but i've been i've been aware of your account and the work the advocacy work that you're doing for native americans indigenous folks like i've seen that like yeah. I said at the beginning, and you've been on my wish thank list. Thank you so, so much for saying that because I'm the same way. I watch so many YouTubers. <laughs> I watch so many like Instagrammers, bloggers, mm. bookstagrammers. So trust me, I'm the same way where I'm very inspired by so yeah. many creatives that I see online. And I think that's agreed. Books bring a lot of people together in so yeah. many different ways. And I think it's so cool that you have performing artists and hip hop artists and creatives from everywhere because I just, that passion for the arts is involved in books, mm. you know? It is a form yeah. of creativity. Absolutely, and I think what's been surprising for a lot of the followers and listeners, people who watch is that these are people they see and it's like they're telling their story, they're sharing their journey, but they love to read. You know, yeah. it's like, oh, uh, yeah. that yeah. guy loves to read. Oh, I wouldn't have even guessed. So it's it's that kind of, and like obviously education, books and music, you know, the arts, creative arts, that's, those are things that I love to talk about. Mm -hmm. So I bring on people that just, you know, I'm loving what they're doing and everyone has yeah. a story, you know, success has been reached in so many uh, by taking so many different pathways, you know, it's, you know, success yeah. looks so different for everyone. And it's just, mm -hmm. this is really a space to, um, just to champion those stories, you know, not just Pacific Island stories, but, um, and, and changing that narrative that people have about us, but also, uh, amplifying BIPOC voices as an educator. I'm a social totally. justice teacher as well and a language mm -hmm. teacher. So yeah, that's I feel what like I was that's ask. part of my you teach language as well. Yeah. I'm, I'm a mm -hmm. acquisition teacher. Like, uh, it's EAL, but um, I've we've changed the name. So now my role is language support, where I'm pushing into the classrooms. I do have one acquisition class, English mm -hmm. uh, acquisition class. So you yeah. know, I feel like as an educator, it's part of um, yeah, like it's you know amplifying uh, you know voices that are not uh, so often heard. You know, yeah, um, totally. so it's been. Um, so I say all of this, that, that long story, I say all of this yes. to say that, um, you know, that's why you're here and I appreciate, um, you know, I, I want to highlight what you're doing um, on your yeah. platform and thank you so hopefully much for that will get people, you know, to check out what you're doing. It's important. I mean, I've just met, yeah, man, I've met like, I mean, a lot of people I, that have come on the show, I know them, but I've met. I've been connected to a lot of just other amazing people. Everyone has a story to tell. If we're not sharing these stories, then who is? So, 
Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> agreed. So agreed. And I think what's amazing about books, just like you said, is everybody has a story um, and we're not alone. Mm, right? That's my yeah. favorite part. Every single time I finish a book where I'm like, the human condition mm. is something that we're all experiencing. And like you said, just meeting all kinds of folks, because I think what's really incredible is definitely I've read so many Native authors. Mm. And also as a, as a result of being in this space too, there is allyship everywhere as well, you know? And I think equally, we can't do this alone, right? The mm. kind of collective social change that we're hoping for the world is something that mm. is you know, our efforts is something to be collective together. And what's mm. that's for my podcast, what the reason I wanted to also include, you know, authors or folks from all kinds of backgrounds too, is to be like, you know, we're doing this together. We're learning together. We're making change together. We are, you know, um, trying to champion and create change, activism, education mm. for all kinds of people and thankfully since I've joined bookstagram I've just met all kinds of amazing people that love mm. books and I think that's something that a lot of is like consistent in so many readers is mm. all kinds of readers want to learn want oh yeah to learn they're open-minded to learn and I just I just love that <laughs> mm. Um, how do you take care, you know, outside of the wonderful work you're doing with your bookstore and with, you know, online with your bookstore, bookstagram account and advocacy for Indigenous folks, you know, mm -hmm. how are you, how are you looking after yourself, um, your mental Such health? Such a great question. <laughs> you know this as a teacher. It's something that's so important. <laughs> I yeah, feel like yeah. a lot of teachers have taught me about, you know, taking time for yourself. Um, and yeah, my favorite thing re as of recent has been journaling a lot. Me too. And yes, absolutely love journaling. And I've been at the same time writing some poetry during my journaling time. Mm. And just so just talking about community work, I think that everything is a balance that community work is so important for, and it's instilled in our cultures so mm. much as, you know, Native people. It's so instilled from a young um, age and throughout our lifetimes, which I absolutely adore. And equally, I'll speak for my own, you know, um, uh, tribal experience. There's also time where being alone and meditating mm. and having alone time and isolation to recharge is so important. And, you know, we have stories from our community of, you know, powerful medicine people that would, you know, um, isolate and be in ceremony with themselves only. And, um, you know, during those ceremonies, all type of medicinal things were happening. And I think it's still relevant to our, you know, human experience now. And so journaling and poetry and a lot of times, too, I've been trying to, you know, gather more and, um, you know, drink more traditional mm -hmm. teas that I that are local. Um, I do a lot of that stuff by myself. So like even last night, made a cup of tea, got my book <laughs> and had my little journal and poetry time um, because I think it's important to have mindfulness mm. and doing some breathing time. And sometimes I incorporate some like stretching time, um, just like stretching my body, getting some movement in and all of that is solely for me, solely mm. for, you know, Carol Ann, CJ. <laughs> um, that's one of my nicknames is CJ. So mm. I think that that's really important for anyone out there who, you know, is working in community and doing any type of, you know, teaching and being in education, working at a library, um, you know, working in publishing and all kinds of stuff is carving out time for yourself 
to be one with self is so monumentally important for our mental health. Um, mm. And yeah, journaling, You, I mean, I'm new to this, but in the last month and a half, I've just been like setting timers in the morning or in the evening where I'm just like, here's my time <laughs> mm. to talk about pen to page, just like let it out, you know? And a lot of times during that space, I am practicing the gratitude for mm. my spiritual, you know, my spirituality and just kind of the religion that I grew up with in a native mm. home and saying gratitude for the spirits that came before me from all sides of my family. And then also I think what's really amazing about journaling is taking the time to just write down gratitudes for right now. Like what am I grateful for right now? Sometimes I write, I'm grateful to be able to have fresh air. Mm -hmm. I'm grateful to have access to water. I'm grateful that I have a full belly. Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful, you know, that I have music to play right now while I'm listening or, you know, some good medicine that I'm burning. And that's something that is, is instilled in our culture and, you know, um, ancestrally is that gratitude was practiced every single day. And so that's been so healing for my self-care time this year mm. for the last month and a half. I love that. I love you mentioned the journal. I have mine. <laughs> right here Love I'm not it. actually well you know it's so funny that you mentioned that because I this is I, I'm not really a resolution person uh mm -hmm. I said this in this podcast I just dropped but yeah um, I got my friend gave me this and like end of last year for Christmas and I love stationery so she gave me this and some yes. really nice pens and then I decided um I'll just try like from the first of January I'll just try and write uh, I've written every day except for I think a week ago I did an audio a voice memo and then I was like I'm gonna yeah, play it back still. later and write it yeah but I've I've even surprised myself like you know like you said like uh, you know gratitude you know thankfulness that kind of vibe like yeah I try and write um lots but there's some days when you know like last for example last week was a real challenging week and some days I've just written a few lines <laughs> you know like yeah. my energy is just so totally has been so like yeah just just the emotional Tired. and mental toll yeah. so um but yep uh, I it's so cool to hear you say journaling um that got me real hyped just then and I was actually journaling yeah. before you came online <laughs> yes so, and I'll um, say you know <laughs> I think it's amazing because I, for example, I didn't journal yesterday mm. and I think consistency is an important mm. thing and also giving ourselves grace, you know, we oh, did yeah. a lot of, of amazing things and, you know, being okay with our emotional capacity mm. at some times. Um, and, uh, it's, yeah, it's like just been so nice to just like carve that time for myself. And speaking mm. of stationary, also oh. you're in Japan, which where like <laughs> the best kind of station this is like muji pens and stuff um, i know it's so good <laughs> yeah i and have a whole I show you case. One more? yeah go ahead oh, of course yes, one more thing so my friend coco who is chickasaw shout out coco if you're watching she's um one of my native friends that i made in college she introduced me to these like kind of they're like kind of tarot-ish cards mm. um these are called visions in the liminal space and sometimes when I sit down to write, I'm like, I don't know what to write. What am I supposed mm. to write about? You know? And so I love prompts. And what's cool is it has all these like beautiful, Ooh. you know, little illustrations on them. And it comes with a booklet that talks about each illustration. And they're mm. just like very philosophical kind of things mm. to write about. And so... I've been doing them with my dad even. And he was like, he was like, are we doing tarot? <laughs> tarot cards, you know? And I was like, no, 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 these aren't tarot. These aren't tarot. And we were doing them for a few days. And mm. I was like, yeah, these are tarot cards. <laughs> because 
sometimes it just felt like <laughs> like predict what I was going through in my day, you know. And so it was funny. We were just joking around. It's a little, it's a little magic there. <laughs> oh, you're so funny. Um <laughs> Man, what 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 do you uh you know as we start to wrap up the podcast, I wanted mm-hmm. to ask in terms of your bookstagram and your podcast, uh, how would you like to see that grow uh in 2023? Yes. So for my bookstagram too, um, I think something that I'm working to continue keep doing is collaborations. Mm. And um Locally, I've been collaborating with so many other California indigenous women Mm. who thank you to all of those girls and women that I have found friendship and mentorship in. And um, I've I've also collaborated with all kinds of other native bookstagrammers as well. But I think this year in particular, like, man, I have so many friends locally and cousins, because a lot of times we're cousins too, that I'm just (laughs) like, oh, it is so cool to share this book love with them and this book excitement. Mm -hmm. Um, So that's something I just want to keep, you know, um, showing them on my platform Mm -hmm. and lifting them up and their authorship. And I've recently been... um, equally, you know, um, finding some local, also California native younger girls than I am that Mm. can join me in my bookstore and can join me in my bookstagram work that I'm doing. And I think maybe this is something you can relate to too, is I think we are also in our native cultures taught that, you know, apprenticing and helping each other learn something is really important. And so, I see a lot of my cousins and girlfriends that really love books and want to get involved and maybe own a bookstore or maybe start a bookstagram or start a podcast Mm -hmm. um, or do some type of mutual aid activism. And I'm like, let's, you know, work together on something like that. And if there's some type of knowledge that I can share and help out with, um, I'm happy to do that. So Mm. yeah, that's been so awesome. Like just, I've made some Tongva friends, which is another local tribe, some Luisenio friends, Chimawavi, Kawia, like all kinds, you know, all over the state. And so I, that's one thing I'm keeping to focus on the podcast and in bookstagram is like keeping up those collaborations. It's my favorite part is being in community. Yeah. I love it. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, um, Carol Land, CJ, CJ, <laughs> yes. I, you know, I, I just, man, um, this is mind blowing. Like everything I've, I appreciate you coming through today. I appreciate you sharing space. Uh, yeah. thank you for sharing knowledge. Thank you for sharing, you know, parts of your journey, but especially books, which we both books. love, like it means a yes. lot. Um, I'm excited to, uh, to, to, post more information about you in the bio so that you know my followers and and people that I know can actually connect with you and um, maybe even pick up a book from a Native American author that they've never heard of before so um, I just want to say for you just to you know keep up the the advocacy work I see you um, you know keep being intentional and impacting the lives of your own community and just people that you come across so you know I'm a fan uh it's such an honor to have had you here on the podcast today uh yay yeah thank so you so I much just... Rosa and I'll say to my followers because I'm going to be reposting please follow reads with Rosa thank you for all of your podcasting work I love and I'm so admiring your consistency and your passion for meeting all kinds of people through this platform and sharing stories, making space for us to connect and bond over literature. So Mm -hmm. um, equally, I can't wait to repost and share, follow, like, subscribe, (laughs) leave an amazing comment. I love Um, all that stuff. Before we go, Carol Ann, I'd like to give the guests, um, thank you for the plug. I appreciate you so much. Uh, final, final, final words of encouragement or a quote 
that speaks to you uh, just to close off the mm-hmm. show? Um, uh, I, um, Anach Kache, um, Kai, uh, Kaim, uh, Munyev, uh, Yanamoin. Be well. Don't go in anger. Don't go with things in anger and in darkness. Um, that's a really big lesson that I've learned from some of our stories is, you know, try to think rationally. Sometimes it's hard to live in this world and in this society. But if you take a moment, some deep breaths and think about leading a heart with kindness and leading a heart with compassion, everything's going to be okay. Yeah, that's one of my favorite quotes from our stories. Don't go in anger. 